And what we're tracing today, as you uh, could guess if you look down at the title of the gospel lesson, is the, the coming of the king. We're going to be looking this uh, Christmas season at the coming of the king, what Jesus' coming and his coming as king, what that means for us and, and why that's good news that we have this king who has come. And so we uh, look this morning at these various passages and, and notice, if you will, as we look at each one, how each of them speaks to, to Jesus ruling or Jesus being a, a king uh, for us. So we begin this morning with Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 1. Uh, this is God's word, eternally true. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then down to verse 6. And Jesse, the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. And then verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And then on to chapter 2, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Then down to verse 6. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Now turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 1. That's found on page 723 if you're using the Bibles in your seats. I'll give you a moment to get to that. Luke chapter 1. And we'll begin with verse 30. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And then lastly, look down to chapter 2, verse 4. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Here ends our reading. Let us give thanks to the Lord. We have a response of thankfulness printed for us there in our bulletins. The word of the Lord. Thanks, be to God. thanks indeed. When we talk about Jesus coming, we know from the nativity stories that we've got these uh, references to the fact that Jesus is a king. And we sing about it a lot in our uh, Christmas songs, glory to the newborn king. Uh, it may not be something we think a lot about beyond the, just the nativity scene and we think about the Magi coming and putting the gold before Jesus, a kingly gift certainly, and, and Herod being intimidated that another uh, king is in his land. Uh, but this is a, an item of good news for us that this king has come and this item of good news has effect in our lives because Jesus, as you see here, as we've titled this, is a perfect ruler. Um, now, God's people are given dominion, or, or people in general are given dominion with Adam. And we saw that in what Frank read for us from Genesis. Adam and Eve are placed in the garden and they're told to, to have dominion, to exercise dominion over all the earth. But our, our exercising of dominion isn't much better than Adam and Eve's. Um, we have things, I, I, I have recently in my mind, things of oil. You know, in the, the large scale, we got the BP 
oil spill in the Gulf that wasn't exercising dominion very well. Um, or in a lesser case, I was so mad on Friday. Um, I, Larissa's home, and, and so I went to change her oil um, in, in, in our garage driveway there. And I changed the oil, and I'm getting efficient at this. I've got two sets of ramps now, so I can change two cars at once. And, you know, I'm, I'm like a machine. And, and it's uh, <laughs> I, I didn't grow up knowing anything about cars, so that's a big accomplishment for me. But uh, uh, as, as I did this, um, you know, I've got one set of oil for this car and one set of oil and another kind of filter for the other car. And, and then I've got empties. You know, you buy oil in five-quart containers. And so I keep some empties to dump the old oil in so I can take it into AutoZone or Advanced Auto Parts or wherever and, and recycle that. And all that's good. Well, I had, I, had, I had not recycled the oil from the last time I changed oil about a m month ago on another car. And so I took the oil container that was, there was one that was full, there was one that was half full. And I took that oil container and I pull it to the side and I'm, I'm getting ready to dump the, the old oil, the old black sludge from Larissa's car uh, into that. And I do some other things and I come back to it and I take the, 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 um, the oil pan and I start pouring that with the funnel and all into this you know, half full uh, oil container. And I do that, I fill that up, and then I go to the next one, which is completely empty, and I fill, fill that up too. And, and then I, I screw the lids on these things, and then I look around and I notice something. When I had been changing Larissa's oil, um, I, I emptied one, uh, about four quarts, and she needed about 4.5. I only had four quarts left in this one. So I need another half quart of oil, maybe a quart of oil uh, more. And, well, if you get what I'm saying here, if you can read the end of this, I poured the sludge into a container that contained four good quarts of oil. Now, I can, I've got a coupon for a 1999 oil change. And, and an oil change actually costs you about 14 bucks. And so I just put sludge into new oil, four quarts of new oil, that's $12 worth of oil. Um, so I've just spent more money getting dirty <laughs> instead of just taking it and having someone else get dirty for me. That is mismanagement. That is not um, exercising dominion well. And you can think of things in your own life where you've done something stupid. You didn't realize you were doing something stupid at the time. And you just mismanage it. And, and that's life in the world today. We, don't, we try to exercise dominion well sometimes, but we don't always. Sometimes we're doing our very best, like I was trying to do a Friday right before dinner. Uh, but, but you just don't manage it well. And that's the condition in which we live. We live in a condition in which we're trying to manage things well, but we goof. We're, we're making eggs, and one breaks and falls to the floor. Those kind of things happen to us. And, and so if you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, you can go ahead and, and, and start writing in there. You can just listen if you want to. If that works better for you, that's fine. But that's, that's point one for us, just recognizing our condition. Point one is in life... Our work is frustrated. I was so frustrated. This morning when I went out, I had to move the, the, the sh my, my garage and lawn shoes out from underneath the tires of, of the car because when I went inside, I took off my shoes and I threw them back in the garage as hard as I could. <laughs> as hard as I, could. I think L Larissa was the only one home. I think she kind of heard me banging around in there. But in life, our work is frustrated. Our work is frustrated. Our fruitfulness is hindered. We're not as fruitful as we'd like to be. We're not as effective as we'd like to be. We don't produce as much as we would like to produce. Even that oil change as efficient as I was, it took longer than I wanted it to. And then we're naturally outside the garden. 
We're naturally outside the garden. And the fact that we're outside the garden is the reason we're not efficient, the reason we're not as fruitful in things, the reason our work is frustrated in this life. And there are two reasons for this. Two reasons that our work is frustrated, that we're less fruitful than we were created to be, and that we're outside the garden. Two reasons. The first reason is your A point there. This is because of sin. This is because of sin. Our sin, our own sin, and the sin of other people. Okay, first of all, the sin of Adam. Okay, so things are broken. Death is in the world. Frustration is in the world. But also our own sin messes things up for us. When I talk badly about somebody or to them or express anger to somebody, uh, then uh, my relationship with that person is damaged. That's my own sin causing frustration and chaos in my life. Or when it's someone else's sin, you know, somebody else does something that's inconsiderate and you're left holding the bag. We live in a world that's like this. This is our everyday, this is our everyday experience. So sin brings that about. Uh, Isaiah 24, I've listed it for you there. The earth dries up and withers. The world languishes and withers. The exalted of the earth languish. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws. That's us. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear their guilt. Therefore, earth's inhabitants are burned up and very few are left. Frank read for us this morning similarly in Genesis 3.6. The earth is cursed. And by the sweat of our brow, through thistles and thorns, we have this limited fruitfulness. That's from our sin. But there's another reason that we have frustration in work and a lack of fruitfulness, and it's because of our own mismanagement. That's your next blank there. It's because of our mismanagement. Again, our own mismanagement and others. Okay, Friday, my own mismanagement, not taking care that I put the, the, the five-quart uh, 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 bottle there of uh, um, new oil off to the side where it wouldn't be mixed together with the, the old oil. Uh, sometimes it's our own mismanagement of things. Uh, I really want to get something done, and so I finish it, and then I'm late for something. Okay, and that's frustration, and that causes relational turmoil. Or sometimes it's somebody else who does something, who mismanages things for us. Ever talk to somebody on the phone, and you're trying to get something done, something's wrong on your bill? Okay. They're not managing things well, and that causes frustration uh, for us in life. Um, so our mismanagement. I have a bunch of things with oil. I could keep going. There was a time in Orlando, I was popping popcorn, and I was doing it the old-fashioned way, and I forgot to put the lid. <laughs> I went back to check on Larissa or Allison back in, in one of their in the room back there, and I came back, and there's popcorn oil and popcorn all over the stove and the counter and the kitchen floor. Oh, mismanagement. We do this despite our best efforts. And this is, and this is your C point here, this is the curse. This is the curse. Through the sweat of our brow, things don't work out well. We still get some things done. We still get to eat. Things still work out kind of okay for us, but it's through this process of frustration I just looked at one of you who's a teacher. We've got teachers and administrators here. And you know you love to teach. That's why you went into it. But you've got these frustrating kids. And you've got these forms that you have to fill out because everything's so legalized now. And, and you have to cover the school's tail and everything. And so, so being a teacher is half about filling out paperwork now. And you just got into teaching because you loved kids and wanted to teach. Um, our, our lives are full of frustration. This is the curse our work is not as fruitful, it's frustrated. So that's the curse upon us. Now, here's the good news of Christmas. The good news of Christmas, and it's number two here. King Jesus came to earth to crush the curse. King Jesus came to earth to crush the curse. We'll just 
touch this briefly and go on and expand it in number three. But Galatians 3.13, Frank read this for us in our declaration of the gospel this morning. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Now certainly here we have the forgiveness of sins. The curse coming against us because we're sinful people and it's more than just spilling popcorn on a floor or wasting 12 bucks of good oil. It's the curse that comes upon us that's an eternal curse because we've disobeyed an eternal God, all of us. And what our sins deserve is what God told Adam in the garden is death. The day you disobey me, you will die. And so Adam spiritually dies then and he begins the process of physical death. And this comes to us because of our own sin. And what we're told, and this is good news about Jesus, is here's this king who's born to die. Born to take care of the curse so that we don't experience the second death and be tossed into hell in the lake of fire forever. This is the kind, gracious, loving God that we have who sent his son to be mocked and humiliated so that that wouldn't have to happen to us. Jesus became on the cross that curse for us so we wouldn't be cursed eternally through faith in him. Now, onward. Number three. Number three. Jesus crushed the curse he crushed it. I love saying that. Jesus crushed it. He crushed it by his death. He crushed it by his death. He became the curse for us for our sins. And for today in our daily lives, by his active, perfect, unfrustrated kingship, rulership, and dominion. That's your word there in your blank. Dominion. I want you to make the connection here between what Adam was given. He was made king or a dominion haver on the earth. That was his role. He was uh, created as the last thing of creation and given dominion over all of creation. Not to abuse creation, but to take care of it. To tend the garden, to take care of all creation. The animals, the plants, everything. He was to be good in his having dominion over all things. And part of that dominion was remaining in obedience to God who held it all together. So we don't do such a good job at that. But Jesus, he is king. And here's your blank here. He is king come to rule. And so that's why in these nativity passages that we read this morning, we hear this reference over and over again. This is a theme God wants us to get and not forget. Jesus comes to rule, to be, to be king, and not a king in Jerusalem. Jesus was clear with his disciples, that's not the throne I'm aiming for. And we find out upon Jesus' resurrection and his ascension that he's aiming for the throne at the right hand of his father, Above. And so we have all these verses here, and those are the ones we read that are listed there. Jesus came to rule. So, A in your outline there, unlike us, and here's the good news, he rules well. He rules well. He doesn't leave popcorn on the floor or waste oil. He rules well. He does, as people said of him when he preached and taught and healed people in the Gospel of Mark, this man does everything well. This is good news. Jesus does everything well. We want to, but we're frustrated. We want to be fruitful by doing everything well, by exercising dominion well, and we're not fruitful like we should be. So Jesus rules well. Um, so today, B, good news, here's how it connects us up with us. He rules his people, the church. Jesus rules us. And this is part of why it's good that he died, because he resurrected from the dead. He rose to heaven. He took his place at the right hand of God, and he sees us every day, every minute. He sees us, whether we're in Australia or in the United States or Norway. 
He sees us because he's not in Jerusalem on the earth. He's in the heavenly Jerusalem. He's up above and he sees us all the time. And he rules us, his people. Uh, Colossians 1.18 says, He is the head of the body, the church. Jesus is our head. He's our king. And then C, not only today, but upon his second coming with the new heaven and the new earth, he will rule all things. And that's good news even more so. Right now, he's ruling us, and that helps us. We'll talk about that in a minute. That helps us that he's ruling us. But one day, Jesus will return, and he'll rule everything. And sin, ours, and the sin of others, both of which that harm us and cause us to be frustrated and to lack fruitfulness, this curse, all those things will be cast away when Jesus comes again when Jesus rules all. And so Matthew 25, 31 through 46, Jesus talks about when, he, when I come again in my glory, I will cast out all wickedness from my presence and the presence of my people so that you will be at peace and blessed by me. Or Revelation 2, 27, and this repeats and many times in Revelation, he, Jesus, will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. And he has received authority from his, from his Father. And so Jesus will rule over all things. And all things will be actively, completely, utterly under his dominion. Under his perfect rulership. We'll always get the green light and so will everybody else. And somehow that will work all the time right now it doesn't the words world's in chaos two people want to cross an intersection at the same time okay so on to number four on to number four so it's good news that jesus has come to rule it's good news that jesus has come to crush the curse both the curse of against us for our sins eternally but also the curse that frustrates our our, our work and our fruitfulness and then number four, he comes to crush the curse by his rule over us because he is king over us, the church today. And he does this and then we have fruitfulness. So by Jesus' rule over us, we as believers in him have fruitfulness. This is what God intended for us. When God created us, Genesis 1, 28, he creates man, creates them, man and woman, um, creates man and woman in his image, and he says, be fruitful and multiply. Have dominion over the earth. And so this is what we were created to do as human beings, as people who bear God's image. We're to be people who are having dominion and being fruitful in our exercising that dominion. It's God's design for us to be fruitful in our work. And the fact that Jesus is ruling over us as believers today helps that frustration be a little bit less. Helps our fruitfulness be a little bit more. Now, it won't be perfect. And that's so that we long for Jesus to return when it will be. We won't solve our own problems. We won't have perfect fruitfulness. We won't exercise dominion perfectly well. And that causes us to long for Jesus to return when we will, when we'll reign with him and exercise dominion perfectly because our sin natures have been taken away and so have everybody else's. But by his rule over us, we will have fruitfulness and increased fruitfulness in our lives. So A in your outline there, by his rule, he gives us earthly, earthly, by his rule, he gives us earthly fruitfulness, yet laced with frustration and a longing for his return. So we got two things going on. Jesus is reigning over us, and that gives us greater fruitfulness and earthly stuff. We do things better. Natural things in life work out better for us because Jesus is reigning over us. But it won't be perfect and that imperfection causes us to long for him to return, and that's good. 
when that's right. We never are to be at the place where we say, I figured it all out. Jesus, you don't have to come now. I'm doing fine without you, right? Frank read for us what is also said in, in Psalm uh, 1-3, that those who follow and trust in the Lord have this fruitfulness. Um, Jeremiah 7, 17, 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. See, this is for the believer. This talks about the believer and the fruitfulness that believers can expect that's different from the completely frustrated fruitfulness of the non-believer. Jeremiah 7, 17, But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. And so in our lives, as we're doing things, as we're relating to our kids, as we're relating to our mom or our dad, as we're relating to our boss or relating to our underlings or relating to our neighbors, as we're doing things in life, as we look to King Jesus and to his word, it directs us and it gives us instruction in life so that we interact with people appropriately, so that we do things ethically. And this causes us to have greater fruit in our lives, better relationships, better promotions because we've treated those who are above us better and they actually like us. We're looking, we've been looking in Sunday school at, at Daniel and Joseph and they did this. They followed God's law. They were faithful to him. They were faithful to their treatment of the kings under whom they served and so they get promoted over and over. If you follow God's ways, generally true, things will go well for you. You will be fruitful even in a season of drought, so to speak. And so this is true in two ways. One, it's true, and it's your next line there. It's true by God's supernatural sovereignty. One, if you're following the Lord, he delights to bless you. So supernaturally, he will bless you. He'll cause things to go your way. Okay? Now, this is not always. Sometimes he wants to develop you and to make you more like his son Jesus, and that's by things not going your way. Okay? So that's why pop that popcorn and blew that oil. God was making me more like Jesus there. Um, boy, it's easy for me to rest in the sovereignty of God when the sovereignty of God is something big, but something little and minute there. I'm saying, God, what lesson do you have for me in wasting that $12? Can you tell that bugs me? <laughs> but sometimes it's just by supernatural sovereignty, he blesses us. He delights for us to follow him so he can show us how good he is and how much he wants to bless us. Taste and see that the Lord is good, David says. But sometimes it's just simply by us following his law. That's your next blank there, by following his law. As we do the things, as we behave in the way he tells us as believers to behave, things go well for us. If I honor my mother and father, guess what? I get better gifts at Christmas. I do. I don't do it for that, but that will happen. Um, if you treat your authorities with respect, those who are over you with respect, guess who they're going to give the promotion to? You're probably going to be pretty high up on their list. And this is just following God's word, God's law. And then B in your outline here, not only does God give you earthly fruitfulness, things like this, just everyday life kind of stuff, things going better for you. But B, by his rule, he gives us spiritual fruitfulness as well. He gives us spiritual fruitfulness as well. In our lives, though, again, this won't be perfected and this just causes us to long for Jesus to come back all the more. Spiritual fruitfulness. Listen to these verses that I'll read to you. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit in our lives is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Spiritual fruitfulness. Because Jesus is reigning as King. He's producing fruit in us spiritually. John 10, 10, Jesus says, I came that they might have life 
and might have it more abundantly. Fruitfulness. Or a little bit later in John 15, Jesus says to us, his disciples, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, but must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. In verse 5 of chapter 15 of John, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. That's God's design for us. God wants us to be fruit-bearing people. And Jesus looked at the Jews during his day who weren't bearing fruit, who were crusty old legalists, who were causing people to run from the kingdom of God instead of coming to it, who were showing no grace, no patience, no forgiveness. And Jesus says this to them, Matthew 21, 43, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, he's speaking to the Pharisees, and given to a people who will produce its fruit. God wants people who will produce its fruit. But the good news is he does that through us. It's the fruit of his spirit. That's God's design for us, that we be fruitful, that we be fruitful. And so that's his design for us personally, that we'd be people that grow in our patience, grow in our kindness, grow in our self-control, grow in our love, grow in the peace that's in our spirits, but also in the church. And that's your C point there. By his rule, he makes the church, he makes the church fruitful too. Colossians 1.6 says this. Paul's writing about the gospel and he says, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. The church is expanding. The gospel is bearing fruit. The Pharisees' legalism isn't bearing fruit. It's not growing. But the gospel is bearing fruit. This message that it not, does not matter what you've done. It matters who you come to. Jesus, who will forgive your sins, who will renew your life, who will make you fruitful. And Jesus says this again from our John 15 passage from which we were reading. John 15, 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. In verse 16 from John 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so he sends his disciples out to bear fruit, fruit that will last. Other people who believe, who become a part of the vine, who become new branches, fruit-bearing branches, a part of the vine of Jesus. And so God's design is that you and I are fruitful in our day-to-day -day life, in the earthly stuff. That you and I are fruitful in our, in our souls, fruit of the Spirit. And that you and I in the church, that the church is fruitful through its gospel proclamation as that goes out. And this will occur, and then here's your blank there, until final harvest at the end of Jesus. It's God's design that the church continue to be fruitful as Jesus reigns over us, as he sends us out as our king and says, here are your marching orders, my people. As king, here's what I tell you to do. Go, make disciples of all nations. Proclaim repentance and the forgiveness of sins. Be my witnesses. These are the marching orders of our king. And he sends us out with a mission of fruit. The fields are white for harvest, he says. So we do this until final harvest, and that's Matthew 13. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The harvesters are the angels. Jesus speaks of his second coming as the final harvest. And right now what we're doing is we're planting or, or sowing the gospel, putting those seeds out there, and we're trusting that God will make those seeds fruitful that his kingdom will grow, 
that it will expand, that there'll be more branches added to the vine of Jesus until Jesus returns. And so, conclusion. As we think about Jesus this Christmas, there's good news in the fact that he's king. There's good news in the fact that as king, he is rule, ruling. He's ruling over us today from heaven. And by his rule, this makes us fruitful in our work. By his rule, our work is less, less frustrated. And so we say here, conclusion, Jesus' coming was good news because of his perfect rule and how that benefits us. You and I are not alone. Jesus sees us, and he's ruling over us, and he's sending his spirit to make us fruitful in our lives, that we can exercise dominion in a greater and greater way.